Hello everyone, welcome to the live question and answer session for session five of the Exarch Discord YouTube conference. This session will be recorded so you can access it later on YouTube along with the rest of the conference. And we're going to start with Sam. Sam, would you be able to make a core out of chert or other materials or would the flaws in the rock make it difficult? Um, thank you for the question. So um, the, the milling machine is able to handle material that, that has uh, pretty high hardness measurements. So um, even with variation among raw materials, the shape will come out to be identical. But what's important is that uh, these flaws or internal inclusions will be exposed onto the surface um, on the core. So the shape will be identical, but these material variation will still be represented among the cores. And that's one thing that's quite important uh, with this process is that we need to increase our sample size um, to really look at how these variation influence the flaking uh, outcome in our experiment. Thank you. And um, a question that's for both you and um, Lily, could you use different tools to impact the rock? Um, at, so for example, using a hammerstone or an antler? So for the drop tower uh, setup that I am using, um, I'm using steel ball hammer as um, a proxy or as my uh, as the hammer to make uh, flakes from the course because of how it's designed because I'm using an electromagnetic switch meaning that if let's say if I use an antler um, I will have to figure out a way to somehow make it work with the switch so I can still uh, release it and they can uh, free fall onto the core and also um, it, it, it may be possible, but um, I just have to find uh, have to find a way to make it work with the current setup. Also, uh, because I'm using gravity to drive the hammer, um, it if the hammer morphology is very um, um, very different from what it is now, it might not be able to free fall precisely on where I want it to uh, fall on on the core. So, um, so um, that would be. I don't, I would not say it's impossible, but that will definitely take uh, some work to uh, figure that out. Um, so, so for my part, uh, in contrast to Lily's drop tower design, um, we, we can definitely use different materials for the hammer attachment. All, all it takes really is to produce the hammer from different raw materials and then bring it to our wonderful engineering workshop to say, can you make me an attachment? And they will do it. So currently we're using, we're, we're making a copper to hammer, for example. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, back to Lily. How do your results compare with more traditional flint mapping knowledge? Do they agree with the ideas of experienced flint mappers or are they more counterintuitive? Um, so in this experiment that uh, I present in my poster, um, I mainly examined the um, influence of uh, angle flow on some on specifically um, features of the bulb. And um, to my knowledge, I'm not sure how much it agree with the uh, results from replicative experiments. I can say that it definitely validated some of the earlier results from the um, control experiments uh, specifically conducted by uh, John Speth in the 70s. Um, it's uh, I would say it's in the agreement with, with what he thought, um, but I'm not so sure about how much um, it would agree with what uh, Flint Abbott say, because um, one thing is that the bulb, bulb of percussion, it's, um, it hasn't, to my knowledge, it hasn't been um, really, uh, what should I say, systematically invest, uh, investigated in um, many of the studies. So uh, I can't, I don't have like a def definitive answer for that question. Oh, thank you, uh, very interesting. And um, a question for Connor. Are there also potential dietary differences between modern bat diets versus bat diets in the past, um, which could affect the acidity? Uh, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, so insectivorous bats have much more acidic guano than uh, fruit bats. Um, in terms of whether their diet was much different in the past, that's very hard to tell. 
we we assume that similar species or the same, you know, the very similar species to the ones that we investigated probably had a similar insectivorous diet. Um, I think in the Pleistocene that probably didn't didn't change too much. We specifically picked uh, the uh, species of bat, the uh, eastern horseshoe bat, because they are a good um, analog for that. They're distributed widely, or similar species are distributed widely throughout Asia, and so we felt that they were a good analog for uh, the bats whose poo we were digging up. Um, a question for Ivan and Spiros. So I'll read this out and you can work it out as I, as I go along. Um, this person said, I'm excited by the boat experiments in this paper. Was the square hole in item A used to hold the piece in manufacturing? I think it would have compromised the limb if used for attachment is the first part of that question. Do you want to answer that first and then I'll continue on? Well, it, it was very hard to, to, to make these parts especially with the bronze age tools uh, we are um, uh, working with a very experienced master klima bramov and he using the bronze saw or for, for the work and uh, it is very interesting that in the materials of uh, this sintashta culture uh, in which burials we have these details we have these examples of the little saws it, 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 this source, uh, of course, not for wood, only for the horn, for the anther. He spent maybe eight hours for every example of this ATM A. It's very hard with the carving. He know the techniques how to make the horn more soft, and he using the he boiled these details, but not so much to not make the structure very mild. So uh, he spent a lot of time uh, with producing of this. Uh, my friend, what do you think about this? Yes, I don't know if I understood the correct the correction. I um, think I heard the comment about the hole in item A. So um, the hole in item A was uh, a special uh, construction to... Uh, to, to hold item A on the bow. So we had to make a special, um, let's say a special pin uh, on the bow shaft in order uh, that the item A will be placed uh, on, the, on the limb of the bow. Um, as we describe in the, in the text, uh, we decided not to put item A in the inner side of the bow. We decided to put in the other side. Otherwise, the, um, uh, we would uh, face um, problems of uh, um, uh, that, uh, for example, uh, the, the item A would uh, be detached from the bow shaft and uh, may cause uh, an accident. So with this special pain on the, uh, on the end of the bow limb, we attached item A, we used um, uh, natural glue and uh, sinews, and the um, item A was uh, attached firmly and we didn't have any, any problem. Cool, thank you. And then the second part of that question was about the interpretation of item C as being an arrow rest for various distances. Um, the person who's asked the question says, while it would work well as a site for various distances, to use different levels to change the distance would change the angle of the arrow, therefore decreasing the efficiency of the draw and adding friction against the rest. They're also concerned that it would slow the reloading rate rates. So I think there's two questions in here that they ask, did you try multiple arrows? I know it's a silly Hollywood trick, but it does work when you've got time to preset the arrows, um, especially when you want to get as many arrows as you can into a target in a short period of time. So essentially, did you try shooting multiple arrows? And are you certain that item C would have been an arrow rest for various distances? 
Yes, uh, for the second part of the question, uh, we saw that uh, this uh, device, um, item C, can be uh, used uh, potentially as an arrest. We tested it and we saw that uh, indeed it worked as an arrest. Of course, we, are, we cannot be 100% sure, but um, for us, for our team, uh, we believe that it is the most possible uh, use. Uh, it worked. It definitely worked uh, because um, we could uh, put uh, the arrows in the different levels and uh, we could say that uh, uh, we, could, uh, we could aim in uh, different uh, distances. Uh, that's because the laths of, the, of this um, item uh, gave us uh, the opportunity to shoot uh, an arrow in a higher level or a, um, um, a smaller uh, level. Uh, now, as about the other part of the question, uh, if uh, the, this device could help us uh, shoot the multiple arrows, um, no, we didn't test it, but we believe that this is some kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, this uh, this theory of shooting multiple arrows uh, is not uh, historical correct uh, at any point of uh, uh, human history. So we didn't, uh, uh, you know, put ourselves in the uh, in this question at any time. So we just focused on, um, of course, one arrow at a time, and uh, we used this device uh, trying to shoot. At different distances, uh, aiming at uh, different uh, targets each time, and uh, we saw that uh, it could be worked uh, like this. I absolutely agree with the Spiros because uh, Spiros is experienced archer, and uh, I think it's, these conclusions are correct. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Um, and now a question for Katarina. Um, about the reconstruction of the Enneolithic sanctuary. What woodworking are you hoping to do in your coming program for the museum? Uh, I will translate. Uh, um, with the uh, authentic methods, uh, the team uh, built uh, one log, uh, one experimental log, and uh, the ends of the log Will, will be cut with the stone tools, with the stone uh, axis. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is not uh, completely uh, reconstructed by, um, by the authentic methods, but the basic uh, algorithm, the basic um, moments uh, was reconstructed by the team uh, with the authentic equipment. <laughs> And uh, for for the it it was uh, enough for the measuring of uh, the uh, work um, work time and uh, um, the results show. Uh, we know that uh, this sanctuary was uh, built uh, many times. Uh, have. Uh, to minimally two layers, uh, and uh, we know that uh, they must, uh, they, they was, the ancient people was reconstruct this many times, uh, make the reconstruction of the uh, different uh, logs and the uh, rebuild the circles. Uh, but uh, anyway, it is, um, it is anyway one season, one warm season to build such a structure to build uh, all the sanctuary. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, and then a question for Diana. What is the most important challenge for experimental archeology span in Kazakhstan? How do you see the future? Uh, thank you. Uh, in my view, the main problem is the lack of experimental archeologists and laboratories at universities. Accordingly, most of the students' research don't have an experimental part. To solve this problem in our department, my scientific advisor, Ulan Mikkel, gave me the topic of experimental archaeology for 
practical application of experiment in curriculum. For instance, uh, in this summer, we are planning to conduct series of experiments connected to the process of building of bureau mounts. And I believe that our attempt helps to promotion of those direction among other uh, archaeologists and uh, the number of publication will increase after that. Fantastic, thank you. I hope to see more experimental archaeologists. And a question for Gabor. Could you elaborate on how the damage to the bronze arrowheads compares to the damage on the artifacts? You said most of the arrows hitting the hardwood broke on impact, which is to be expected given such a small socket. And I wonder if it was just to save on bronze or if it was a deliberate, um, deliberate in battle so the arrows couldn't be reused against them. But how did the bronze tips do? Did they fracture, deform, or remain relatively undamaged? Thank you. I'm answering instead of Gabor. And uh, the thing is that uh, we used an alloy, uh, uh, bronze alloy, which contained 12% uh, of tin. And uh, this, uh, this, was, uh, this was probably softer than the originals known from the Ukraine where, uh, for example, from uh, the Ukrainian, Ukrainian Olbia, from the uh, uh, province of Dnepropetrovsk, uh, there is known that the arrowheads uh, contained uh, up to 20% of zinc uh, and uh, uh, the same percent of uh, tin. And uh, whew, this means this alloy uh, uh, was made from uh, brass and bronze. And uh, because of brass contains a uh, high amount of cadmium, which is uh, very unlikely uh, for uh, uh, living systems, uh, I, uh, it's very uh, dangerous to cast, the, uh, cast uh, these arrowheads. Like it's a, a bit more poisonous uh, than arsenic bronze. And uh, these arrowheads would be much more harder. I know uh, a case when uh, we dropped an original and it broke. Uh, so they are much more brittle than our arrowheads. So this uh, could mean that the damages on the original arrowheads were uh, caused by a softer surface they were hitting. And it's not an easy task because of the differences of the possible structures they were hitting. So if the bows would have been stronger, the arrowheads could penetrate it more, deeper. And uh, because the sockets are uh, so uh, thin, it's uh, very likely that uh, the arrowheads should have been broken down uh, in any way. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. And a question for Igor. Uh, how did your horse react to the cheek pieces? Did he like them or did he seem more bothered by them um, than modern equipment? Uh, I will answer for Igor. His horse was very experienced guy and he really liked th these exercises because these Bronze Age cheek pieces, this uh, Bronze Age bridle is much more easy for the horse much more mild and more good for the humanity with the horse to be humanity also he using these cheek pieces uh, in many different variations he used this for the horse riding and also testing them with a little model of the chariot in both variations uh, these cheek pieces show the traceology, the same traces, and it shows us that they can be used in different variations. We know that maybe in these very early times, we don't see the osteological deformation, or, or don't see the uh, deformation of the skeleton, which show us the horse riding, not deformation in the man's skeleton in the burials. But from the late Bronze Age, we have evidences of these transformations. And even from the maybe 15th, 14th century BC in the steppes, of the southern Ural and northern Kazakhstan, we can start to think about the horse riding. Of course, not about the battle cavalry, 
but the evidence is of early horse riding. And these chick pieces can be, be using for the both variants, as I said before, for the chariot and for the horse riding. And his horse really like this more than the modern bridle. bridle. And now we're also working with two horses. And in this winter, we're testing them for the new experiments with the chariots. And both of our uh, horses also like this equipment. So it, it is very good for the horses. They sound like lovely colleagues to work with. Thank you. I'll go back to the question for Eagles, your research. Do you know what type of paint he used for the wear analysis on the cheek pieces? He used the instant marker, the, 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 the marker for the boards uh, and uh, it it looks uh, it it works uh, well uh, because uh, delayed very easy. It you need to um, work in with with uh, with a tool to to delay this completely. We're also using uh, this for our experiment with the bow with the spiros, and uh, it is good variant because it uh, of course uh, show you the the. Um, the place of activity in the use wear and you don't need to uh, work until you have a very big um, penetration you just can wait uh, until you uh, delayed this this pain cool thank you and thinking of paint a question for sam uh, you mentioned you spray painted the core did you continue to spray paint as the pieces were flaked off and did you color code them to show the sequence um, so the cores were only flaked once. Um, they were spray painted before, um, so we can scan them um, and then spray again after the flake detachment so we can scan again. So we get the 3D record of the entire sequence. But again, each core was only flaked once because we want to keep the core morphology constant. Cool, thank you. Thank you. And then a question for Connor. Are you able to determine how long a deposit would have been waterlogged for? Would it have been a result of seasonal flooding, do you think? Um, one of the issues with micromorphological features is that you can see microstratigraphic evidence of sequences of environmental change uh, due to features being superimposed on each other, but you often can't date these um, these features because uh, un unless in an exceptional circumstance perhaps where there is a um, orthogenic um, flowstone or something within a layer uh, something like that um, in terms of what I think uh, I think that it was um waterlogged for for most of the time that it was down there and then uh it it may even have been it not nothing stays completely the same for that amount of time but uh it was it was actually still wet uh when when it was dug up and i think those uh gypsum crystals that formed might even have formed after it was excavated and, and dried out then but really there's there's no way to tell. Um, Thank you. Um, a question for Ivan and Spiro. Um, the old and highly scientific experiments by Semenov are well known around the world. Do you see chances for experimental archaeology in Russia in a more free setting? I mean, not just with a microscope and computer, but in a workshop, handling wood and other materials, like you did with your boat project together with Bacchus. Do Russian scientists appreciate the need of being more experienced with your hands as well as having academic rigor? Or do most archaeologists in Russia believe that that is not scientific enough? Uh, thank you for the question. A very serious question because uh, really we have the very big uh, scientific school of the traceology of the use wear analysis, especially for the Stone Age. And maybe it makes a, a little bit um, problems with the vision of the experimental archaeology in Russia because many scientists think that experimental archaeology, it is only 
the use there and it is only the traceology maybe only traceology of the flint and the stone tools and when your experiment comes outside of this theme somewhere for example in RTA mythology when you can't fix it all the all the stages of the process as an with a stone or for example with our bow experiment many many scientists think that it is not any more very scientific way that it is you you're not prove 100 percent for example uh with the bow we have the traceological an analysis use wear analysis that on the original details we have uh, the traces which prove us that it must be the bow and of course it is important information but for the more understanding to take the more understanding we need to make a big experiment we need to understand why they can construct this type of the bow what these details give to the bow how difficult to construct this bow how expensive construct this bow and for all all of these questions we can answer only with this big complete reconstruction and of course we never can be 100 percent sure that it is exactly what they do in the past but also we don't have the one million bow details in the archaeology so we have our source and i think that if we will do these complex experiments more and more we will show to our colleagues that it is important but because anywhere we have now much more information about this phenomenon we're more closely to our task anyway so my answer is that, of course, not every one of archaeologists think experimental archaeology is not scientific, but a part of Russian archaeologists and uh, especially Stone Age specialists think that it's not very scientific. And even some bodies tell that experimental archaeology, it's not exist. It just exists only use their analysis. And it, it is reason why we don't have here in Russia very big uh, complex projects, which include the scientific, educational and touristic, for example, as big archaeological parks, very little numbers. And our big task to make this. So we, we see on the future with the optimistic. Thank you for that thoughtful answer. That's fantastic. Um, a question for Katrina now. Can you tell us what difficulties you faced? Um, was this your first full-scale experiment and what would you have done different or what would you do differently next time? This is our first project of full-scale reconstruction of archaeological site and, and maybe the first uh, example of reconstruction, the full-scale reconstruction of the sanctuary in Russia. Mm -hmm. The most difficult was uh, the analysis of uh, archaeological uh, resource of the reports because uh, reports was uh, right, uh, writing in the 80s and the, mm -hmm. all, all, the, uh, all the sanctuary was uh, dig in the 80s. Uh, so it, it was a very big task to, to, uh, to analyze of all these materials and create uh, firstly the um, the reconstruction on the paper and the uh, reconstruction of 3d models and all of this and only after this we we prepare and um, start to reconstruct the real uh, process and the second uh, difficulty is um, to put the modern reconstruction uh, parts exactly in the in the original places because uh of course the archaeological report and the real the real site uh is not everywhere uh be equal so on on the ground uh, on the field it was a difficult task to to put the reconstruction on the, on the original places but on the working process, and especially when we work with the ditches uh, of the sanctuary, we saw that we completely done it and we fix all details on the original places. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, a question for Lily. Uh, what inspired your research? Have you tried flint napping by hand? Um, yes. So... 
I have only tried very few times but not being by hand. Um, my so my research was um, inspired by um, the so the drop tower setup. It's a it's it is a classic setup, um, and it has been in um, it appeared for I think over fifty for I think about fifty decades. Now, uh, in the uh, experimental study of uh, of lipids, and I just uh, so for my study, I went back to this classic uh, setup because for several reasons. Um, the main reason is that um, it's much faster to um, set up an experiment using this uh, the simple setup, and um, yet it is still highly controlled, and uh, with the result. Uh, obtained from this um, uh, this simple setup, I can then apply it to more realistic uh, experiments like the setup that Sam is doing for uh, his studies. Um, so it's like I'm trying to, my goal is that to use what I learned from this drop tower setup to, uh, more, to a more realistic experimental setup and then to interpret the archeological record. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and Sam, I'll throw that question at you. Have you done much flint napping by hand? Uh, yes, so I, I've been flint napping since uh, as an undergraduate student through my PhD and now I routinely flint nap um, and also teach um, flint napping in my classes. So yeah, so, so and I think this is an important point to make and it relates to an earlier question about this often um, constructed dichotomy between controlled and, and realistic experiments and I think um, increasingly, uh, there, there are more studies using a mechanical and control experiment. And it's not to say that they are alternatives or, or they're, they're sort of dichotomies. And, and I think Villa Rocks made this uh, point earlier um, in her hotspot um, study that they're, they're complementary and, and they're important components in a, in a coherent hypothesis testing cycle and generating archaeological inference. So um, I think what's important to, to think about these things is not so much as a uh, a dichotomy between what's realistic and what's scientific, but it's more that we generate ideas and hypotheses from from reenactment, right? But we need to have a way to to move forward by validating or potentially falsifying some of these ideas, and this is where control experiments come in. Um, the point of it is not to be realistic. The point of it is to be uh, as rigorous as we can to clarify these questions. Thank you. I'll ask the question again, just to remind listeners. Um, so first, your patience astounds me, Olga. Having carved stone with steel tools, I would have been petrified of the stone cracking. You mentioned going through many of the small bone drill tips, but how often did you have to fix the large drill bit? And how heavy were the weights you added to the side of the drill? Olga use two types of drills. Uh, the one type is a uh, wooden drill, the maple drill, uh, and also the flint drills. Uh, and uh, the weight on the drills is not so heavy. It's near the 600 uh, grams only, but it, it's enough for, for the drilling. The interesting moment that uh, in the first experience with the weights, that you uh, can see on the on the poster of the of the speech, Olga used the drill with the bone tip, a wooden drill with the bone tip, and now uh, she uh, continued the experiments and she uh, produced the vase, uh, Egyptian vase, at the moment using a stone drill on the wood uh, stick, and. Also, um, important moment that she uh, working with a much more harder material. Uh, it is not the marble, it is um, diorite. When yeah. Olga first time working with the vase uh, and uh, working with the uh, marble, uh, she uh, used for all experiment only one leg bone of the cow. But now material is much more harder and she uh, using uh, every day, the new drill, every day. And she needs uh, lots of drills. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that detailed explanation. And now a question for Diana. The open air museum sounds fantastic. 
Do you have a lot of interaction with the museum visitors and are they able to contribute to the research? Unfortunately, I wasn't uh, in those museums this year, but I planned to visit this museum this summer and uh, also ask about experiment and how, uh, my, how many visitors visit and other questions. Thank you. And now a question for um, Ivan and Spiros. Is there a particular reason you tried the Elmwood for the bow for 10 months? Yes, of course. Anyone who is uh, familiar with uh, bow technology would understand that uh, uh, if we don't uh, use dried uh, wood, uh, the wood uh, will break. It's a normal uh, procedure. Uh, everyone uh, boyer uh, follow so that the um, the the staff of the bow will be dried enough. Uh, otherwise, if there's a moisture uh, inside the bow shaft, the um, uh, the bow will uh, definitely break. So we waited for this uh, particular period of time in order to have a dried uh, bow staffs. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, and then. A question for Gabor slash Zoltan. Um, what was the glue used to glue the deer tendon to reinforce the arrows made out of? Uh, yes, we use raw white glue. Simple raw white glue. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the final question I have is for Connor. What material were the boxes containing the experiments made from? Would that have affected the experiment as it would have been a sealed environment? It was food grade plastic, um, uh, polyurethane containers, uh, similar to those that you um, would get a takeaway in. Uh, we chose that material specifically because we would think that it would have no effect on the experiment, particularly at such low temperatures. Um, I so someone else asked me this question, and I've, I've tried to think if there's any way that we uh, could assess for any contamination. But certainly, with the FTIR and geochemistry, we had no indication of uh, contamination from the plastic. So I think uh, it, it didn't have any effect. Great, thank you. So that is all the questions I have for you. Thank you very much for joining.